Welcome everybody. I'm Sunil Amrath, Interim Director of the Mahindra Humanities Centre um, and welcome to the latest um, edition of our conversations on COVID-19. I'm really delighted to have with me my friend and colleague Karen Thornber, who's Harry Tuckman Levin Professor in Literature and Professor of East Asian Languages and Civilizations here at Harvard. Um, Karen has just published um, a wonderful new book, Global Healing Literature Advocacy Care, which really couldn't be more timely. And I'm really delighted, Karen, that you're able to join us for a conversation about your new book. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Sunil. Um, so the book was published last month, of course, in the middle of this global pandemic. And, and it's, it's really a deep and expansive book on literature and medicine, literature and healing. What led you to write the book? Particularly, what was your path from your earlier work um, on environmental humanities to this uh, deep dive into medical humanities? Yeah, so I've long been interested in literature that engages with disease. And actually, my junior thesis at Princeton focused on the French writer Albert Camus' La Peste, or The Plague. That was some years ago, though. So as I was writing my book on environmental humanities, uh, eco-ambiguity, mm -hmm. environmental crises, and East Asian literatures, which followed a book on imperialism and literature, I was also thinking about doing a new book on world literature and health. And what I was going to do is look at literature that engages with diseases and how it's traveled, literature from Asia, the Indian Ocean Rim, and how it's traveled uh, along routes that we don't usually talk about. This project, though, forked into several different projects, ended up writing a series of articles on world literature, and then, of course, did the book on global healing, which addresses a much broader range than I would have been able to work on had I just focused on world literature. But there's also a personal connection to global healing. I had a serious case of Lyme disease when I was in college. Uh, which resulted in my being essentially bedridden for two years. I couldn't sit up without getting really dizzy. I couldn't read. I couldn't concentrate. I had very little short-term memory, so I, I couldn't even watch like a basic, simple TV show. My long-term prognosis wasn't good. We were still in the very early years of Lyme disease, and doctors didn't really know much about uh, how to treat serious cases of Lyme disease. I did end up clawing my way back, uh, learning how to learn again, returning to college, starting the PhD program at Harvard. Mm -hmm. What made a real difference in my recovery, in addition to my amazing family, was having health professionals who not only were brilliant, you know, medical technicians and brilliant medical um, individuals, but who also were compassionate, who were empathic. And throughout this experience and the experience in uh, more recent years of having loved ones with serious chronic conditions, it became very clear to me that the suffering caused uh, by diseases or the suffering caused by social responses to diseases can be even greater than the suffering caused by physical processes of diseases themselves. And I turned to literature, as I always do, to learn more about other experiences of others and what I found uh, just completely amazed me. So really combination of the personal and the professional. Thank you. I mean, you take a, a very expansive view of literature in, in the book, um, including creative nonfiction as well as, as novels and, and other forms. And, and I wonder, why do you think literature has been so central to changing societal understandings of illness and healing in recent times? Oh, that's, that's such a huge and really important question. Uh, literature's frequent focus on individual anguish or anguish of small groups amid broader economic, social, political, and other health dynamics or inequalities, I think uniquely positions it to reveal the deeply penetrating damage that's caused by a lot of our practices or a lot of our behaviors and the real need to transform how, as individuals, as societies, we better prepare for and respond to crises in health. Now, literature is always engaged with disease, illness, and healing. Uh, Joe Lepore had a brilliant article in The New Yorker. Uh, Orhan Pamuk had a great article in The New York Times. Uh, they both spoke eloquently of the great pandemic novels in the Western world. Of course, literature from Asia, Africa, other parts of the world also uh, have, have long engaged with uh, epidemics in sometimes very different ways. Uh, in Japan, for instance, uh, as Robert Campbell, who runs the National Institute uh, of Japanese Literature, he just did a YouTube video on this and uh, shows us all these 19th century works that bring comedy 
two epidemics of measles and cholera. Uh, but unfortunately, his literature historically has often tended to exacerbate stigmas or uh, amplify stigmas, propagate stigmas. And I'm thinking here particularly about leprosy literature, or literature that deals with leprosy, uh, really uh, from biblical times through the 1100s, 1300s, 1500s, and so on. Things have changed dramatically, though, in recent decades, as people in more societies have become more courageous in sharing illness experiences. There's been an outpouring of narratives of, from patients, from their loved ones, mm -hmm. sharing experiences both good and bad. There's been an outpouring of narratives from health professionals uh, sharing their experiences. And these narratives take all kinds of forms, as you said, memoirs, novels, mm -hmm. graphic novels, plays, so on. And one of their most, most significant contributions has been to shed light on just how damaging stigmas against diseases can be. Another significant contribution has been to shed light on how to better alleviate the suffering of individuals um, who are grappling with disease, and also how to better support loved ones and caregivers so that they can care for themselves and care for their loved one. Literature enables readers to engage uh, with the experiences of others in a far more intimate way, I think, than many forms of discourse. It provides an important complement, I think, to uh, you know, what we read in the, the newspaper or here on television, social media, um, historical documents, and so on. Mm -hmm. It provides us with a more uh, sustained human connection, and I think that is, is part of what's changed our social attitudes toward disease in recent times. I mean, just in, in relation to what you were just saying, I have been struck by how many people have turned to literature in the, in the current pandemic in terms oh, yeah. of the whole sort of tradition, tradition of it and, and you know, reading groups and, and collective readings, etc. I think it's been, it's been, I think, very much a kind of confirmation of your point about the dis specific and unique ways in which literature allows us to sort of process these experiences. Um, yeah, yeah. You draw on works in a really sort of dazzling range of languages here. I mean, you call the book Global Healing. Why, yeah. why do you think a global perspective is, is vital here? Uh, there are many reasons a global perspective is particularly important here and I'll just I'll just give some of them mm -hmm. I think taking a global perspective helps us to better understand the broader context of individual community regional national experiences and I want to say you know I, it's true illness occurs mostly within local systems and so throughout the book I address the specific national cultural literary medical context of the narratives I discuss but one of the things that became more and more clear to me the more I read was the value of these narratives beyond their source culture. So at the most basic level, adopting global perspectives allows us to see what aspects of the illness experience might be primarily a function of local systems and what might be more um, unavoidable or more difficult to, to change. Uh, we see this certainly in COVID-19, that there are aspects of the disease that transcend nationality. For instance, uh, individuals who are elderly or who have pre-existing conditions are more at risk no matter where in the world they are. Uh, infection rates, death rates differ dramatically because of particular decisions um, made in, in particular places. Um, but infection death rates are also impacted by decisions made a long time ago. You know, what constitutes a fair wage, uh, how available is health insurance, uh, quality health care. So there's much we can learn from one another and much we can learn from one another going forward, including how to reopen society. But what I've just said holds true far beyond COVID-19. And I want to give a kind of extreme example, but mm -hmm. one that, as I discovered uh, through my reading, is not actually that uncommon. So say you have a loved one with a terminal condition who's begging you for help to end their life. Uh, this di dilemma is something addressed in literature from as early as the time of the ancient Greeks. Uh, in the book, I talk about a play of Sophocles from the 5th century BCE. I also talk about books from Japan and Chile, the US, UK, Spain, that deal with similar issues. So reading how others have grappled with this issue, particularly in communities where medical aid and dying is illegal, I think on a really fundamental level, it helps individuals feel less alone. It gives them different perspectives. It helps them reach decisions or become less uncomfortable with their decisions. 
it can better help them understand beliefs, opinions, choices of others that may be very different uh, from their own. A global perspective helps us reduce exceptionalism, the feeling that we or someone else is unique or special or different or particularly deserving or undeserving, whether in superiority or in suffering. It helps us reduce hierarchies. It helps us reduce stereotypes. And I think most importantly, or one of the very important things that it does, it helps us recognize that uh, experiences and expectations regarding illness don't divide cleanly by nation, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, all the different ways in, in which we divide people. It's, it's much more complicated than that. I mean, I think I really do feel like the book in, in my reading of it was sort of radically perspective shifting in, in just its sort of encompassing and, and global nature. And I wonder if you could share with, with viewers and, and listeners, you know, particularly those who haven't read the book and it's, it's not been out for long. So I suspect many of our listeners uh, uh, haven't yet read the book. I wonder if you could share one particular writer who, whose work you weren't familiar with before you started the process of research. And, and, and... There were many of them. I, I learned so much doing this project. Uh, so one great example, I think, uh, that I'll, I'll share with you all today is the Kenyan writer, Meijia Mwangi, uh, whose novel, The Last Plague from the year 2000, uh, grapples with the HIV AIDS crisis in Kenya. And here in the US, when we think of HIV AIDS literature, uh, we usually think of literature that uh, comes from the United States or from, from Europe, Western Europe. But there's actually, and there is an amazing corpus of such writings, and I talk about several of them in the book, uh, but there's also a huge, huge corpus of writings from other parts of the world, uh, particularly Asia and Africa. And uh, The Last Plague is one of them. So just a few words about this novel. It's set in Crossroads, Kenya. At the outset, the narrator says, hey, you know, suffering, dying is not new to Crossroads. This is a place that's experienced all kinds of trauma. But the narrator says the AIDS crisis is different. He describes it as one um, that, that this is the one thing that the old crossroads cannot uh, survive through, uh, you know, hence the last plague. Mm -hmm. And I just want to read like a couple sentences uh, from the book to give our, our listeners and our viewers a sense. Uh, this is right toward the beginning when the narrator is describing uh, the town. And he says, the land labored under the enormity of its grief. Along the dusty highways, hearses of every nature and description groaned under the weight of their grief. Battered lorries, pickup trucks, heavily laden with coffins and mourners and hung with red ribbons, chugged along, creaking and complaining and steaming at the radiators, the overburdened engines about to give up and die themselves. And along the country roads and the footpaths and the cattle trails that snaked across the highway like living things and divided and entangled the land in a troubled spider's web, Ox wagons and donkey carts loaded with coffins, hung with red flags, dutifully delivered their cold burdens to the gaping holes that awaited them in every village and every hamlet and every homestead all over crossroads. It, so it describes right at the beginning the, the tremendous devastation. But most of the novels focused on the people who are still living. And the narrator talks about how this, this uh, disease has caused people to think of those, or cause those without the disease, to think of those with the disease as basically evil sinners meeting their due. That's how it's described. So it means that the residents don't take care of the AIDS orphans. This includes church elders. They say, you know, these, these children are guilty, they're deserving of their fate. And the narrator is really um, criticizing this, this entrenched belief that AIDS is targeting uh, particular, uh, particular groups because of sins uh, that, that they have committed. And this novel is true of so many narratives on HIV AIDS and other health uh, conditions, makes clear, again, just how much suffering is caused by the social responses to the disease. The orphans themselves don't have the disease. Um, but uh, they can't get any help from anyone because of uh, the nature of their disease. And, and just one more um, thought about the book. One of the principal characters is Juma, who's the uh, local uh, birth control or health, health official. She can't convince people to use condoms because people say, you know, it's only people who are guilty who get the disease. 
and, and so on. So this is one of many, many uh, examples I could have given, but it's hopefully one our, our viewers will, will turn to. Thank you. I hope so too. Um, that, that leads nicely to the next question I wanted to ask you, which is about stigma. And this has already yeah. come up in our conversation. It's a major part of the book. In fact, the whole section of the book is on stigma. The two main case studies you use there are, are leprosy and HIV AIDS. Um, the first question I had is, how far do you think the nature of the disease itself shapes the nature of the stigma that people suffering from it face? No, that's... Um... I think in general, we can say uh, the more disfiguring or lethal the disease, the less that's known about the disease, the greater the stigma. Uh, also, when a disease seems to target members of an already stigmatized group or members of an already stigmatized group uh, seem more at risk for the disease, the greater the stigma of the disease. Um, as diseases become less of a threat, as vaccines are developed or better treatments or cures, stigmas tend to decrease. Uh, we see this, for instance, concerning uh, several forms of uh, cancer. But this is not always true, and there are many exceptions. Uh, leprosy, Hansen's disease, is definitely one of those exceptions. It's been readily treatable since the 1940s. It's one of the least contagious diseases, least contagious of the contagious diseases, because most people have natural immunity to it. And yet, it, uh, there, the stigmas against this disease remain very much alive and well in many parts uh, of the of the world. I mean, taking the comparative perspective that you have, are there broader patterns you've seen in how stigmas can effectively be combated uh, across different societies? Yeah, I think so. I think when you have celebrities who share their experience uh, with the disease. Like when Angelina Jolie shared her experience of being uh, positive for the BRCA1 uh, gene mutation. Uh, I think this was back in 2012, 2013 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. um, that helped reduce stigmas against breast cancer, in particular other forms of cancer that women face. When you have so many celebrities come forth about uh, diagnoses of Alzheimer's, and I'm thinking people as diverse, say, as former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, country singer Glenn, Glenn Campbell, uh, winning as basketball coach Pat Summit. Um, you have British dame Jean Iris, um, Iris Murdoch about whose life her, her husband did a, did a really moving memoir and film. When you have so many people come forward and share their experiences, I think that helps, that definitely helps reduce uh, the stigmas but there are risks to being open with one's condition. And I think, you know, many people, the vast majority of the people uh, can't, particularly individuals who are marginalized, who fear for their jobs or their social standings. Um, so there, you know, in, in those situations, or just, I guess, in all situations, we really rely on our leaders, on those who can come forward to share their own experiences or to educate individuals about particular diseases starting in, you know, when, when, when uh, children are in school, educating them about disease um, and also about the harm that stigmas can, can cause. Uh, I'd also just like to say here, or comment briefly on the COVID-19 stigmas that, that we're seeing yes. uh, in the United States against individuals of Asian heritage, China against individuals of African heritage. I just read an article in the Times yesterday that in Mexico, India, Pakistan, the Philippines, nurses and other health professionals are facing stigmas and escalating violence and being attacked. And I think the more the media can draw attention to this, uh, the more our leaders can draw attention to these stigmas, the more we all can challenge stigma when and where we see it, uh, the better chance we have. But of course, a large part of the problem, if you look, you know, you take the long view through history, is that many, many stigmas have been officially sanctioned. They've come from the top. So it's not only not being challenged, it's being propagated uh, from the top. Alas, I think that is very much the case with some of what we're, we're seeing at the moment in, in different parts of the world as well. Um, yeah. I'm talking about COVID-19 and of course, you know, now we're moving into more speculative mode, but, but what do yeah. you think the literature on this pandemic is, is going to look like? What shape do you think it'll take? What forms do you think it'll take? Well, um, yes, we are being speculative here, but as we're already beginning to see in COVID-19 literature coming out of China, 
uh, coming out of Italy, uh, global literature on the coronavirus pandemic will almost certainly take a variety of different forms. So I'll just list a few here that I imagine it taking. There'll be very vocal criticisms of uh, governments, of leaders, for what was done and what wasn't done. There'll be stories of the heroism or the great efforts that health professionals, other frontline workers uh, did, you know, their, their great um, contributions. There'll be star stories of large acts of kindness, those of smaller acts of kindness. There'll also be stories of violence and stigmas and fear, stories of making life and death decisions, stories of begging for care on the one hand and foregoing care on the other. There'll be individual stories of triumph and trauma, uh, or trauma and triumph, but there'll also be stories of uh, trauma and continued distress. Because one of the things we don't know, but we're starting to get a sense of, is that not only does COVID-19 take a long time to recover from, from people, uh, for people who haven't been on ventilators, but just being on a ventilator can cause so many complications. And so I think, we're gonna see a lot of cases or at least some literature that, that grapples with the very long-term consequences of the physical illness, not to mention uh, the economic and, and social consequences. Absolutely. Karen, thank you so very much for joining us. This is a, really, um, a wonderful conversation. Um, we are grateful and thank you very much. Oh, thank you.